Get ready, it's time for the Daily Breakdown with Mr. Keelan. What's up, 7th and 8th graders? Welcome back to the Breakdown, Mr. Keelan. It's Friday. Yeah, Friday. Friday's still fantastic. At home, at school, at your homeschool thing you're doing right now. Fabulous Fridays all around. Hope you are enjoying it. And it's the end of your first long week that you did so much to accomplish getting where you are. Proud of you guys. Way to go. Shout out to House Reviewer. What's up, dreamers? Every Friday, I'm rocking my blue. I mean, I'm in all the crews now. One ha- one school, one house. But you got you to gotta represent House Pride. So all my unicorns out there, shout out to you. Um, we've been talking about the Articles of Confederation, the epic failure of epic failures, and, uh, we're going to look at one more layer of the failure sandwich that was the Articles of Confederation, and the two articles I asked you to read, uh, for today, uh, I figured we, they both kind of deal with foreign policy problems from the Articles of Confederation, combine them both, you only have to do now one question, which I thought... It'll be a little bit easier for you guys. Give you a little Friday break. So let's look at the objectives for today. Um, Today what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to be able to describe the ways the the Articles of Confederation left the U.S. um, in a powerless position to deal with foreign crises. And there's going to be a number of foreign crises foreign policy problems for America as it's in its infancy the first few years after winning the revolution. Now, we won the war. Now things get really hard because you got to start a country. And what I'd I'd like you to be able to do is describe the ways that the Confederation left the U.S. powerless and give at least one or two examples uh, to back up uh, your, your claim. So let's go to the Western Frontier. And, uh... One of the big problems with the Articles of Confederation is that it made it really difficult to raise a national army and a national navy to deal with foreign problems. We uh, mentioned in, uh, I think, Lesson 3, um, the uh, Articles of Confederation said that states could volunteer forces uh, to an army they say, we'd like an army to defend us right now, and uh, yeah, we'd like to maybe serve, maybe not. You know, uh, if you leave it to the nation to voluntarily serve, it doesn't necessarily uh, coalesce for a strong national army. Especially, let's say, if a southern state has a problem as being threatened, northern states might not necessarily have a uh, incentive to send their forces to help them. Um and we're going to see that this problem is especially pronounced in the Western Frontier. Uh, we talked with that Northwest Ordinance lesson um, about how important trying to sell that frontier was. Well, after the war, the Treaty of Paris, the British are supposed to leave. They had a bunch of fortresses built in that area. And they were supposed to leave those fortresses. Well, who's going to make them leave? You see, the... Uh, the Willy Wonka down there. So what are you going to do about it? Yeah, we're here. We're not going to leave, say the British. We know the treaty says that, but we're just going to keep our forces here because we'd like to eventually take back the land that we lost in the Revolution. See the War of 1812. Um, and uh, normally the U.S. would start sending their armed forces, their military, into this area as a way to put pressure on the British forces to leave. But... uh there's really no U.S. Army to speak of. Uh, it's mostly each different state has its own. And it's uh, what was the strong Continental Army after the war is done starts to kind of fall apart. And there's nothing to hold it together with that article as a confederation. And so here you have the people we just fought a war with are still occupying our Western lands and refusing to leave and... There's nothing we can do about it. And say, hey, you should go. We're not going to, say the British. What are you going to do about it? Go ahead. Try to make us leave. And to which the Americans are like, oh, shucks. Stupid articles of confederation. We're powerless to do anything. Um, problems in the West weren't just with the British. 
our friends, the allies that we had during the American Revolution, the Spanish, A, are pretty ticked at us because we're not paying back our debt to them because we borrowed a lot of money from them, and B, they don't necessarily recognize the Treaty of Paris that says that we claim all that land all the way to the Mississippi River. They claim all the land west of the Mississippi River, including the Mississippi River, and now aren't exactly keen on us using that river. And they put a lot of military forces there to stop Americans from using it to travel and trade. And American farmers that start moving into the western uh, frontier, into the Ohio River Valley, they can't trade their goods easily now because they don't have access to the Mississippi River. Now they have to bring them back over the Appalachian Mountains, which is a pain. And this takes away the uh, protection and incentive for anybody to move out to that frontier. Not to mention the fact British forces are still there. So this is another difficulty. And in order to contend with this, many southern states uh, want to start raising armies. Uh, raise the National Army to push back the Spanish from the areas around the Mississippi River. Uh, send in the National Army to protect Americans. And people from the northern states are like, eh, it's not our problem. Sorry, we're not going to send anybody. And so they can't send anybody. They can't put together a whole army. Each separate state starts forming its own, martial, uh, its own military force. But that doesn't necessarily mean for a strong national armed force. And so the Spanish basically maintain control of that because, again, there's nothing we can do about it. Um, more problems with the British. At sea, uh, before the revolution, remember loyalists and fencers argued, well, the British give us protection at sea. They're our navy. They protect us. They allow us to trade. They're our trading partner. Well, now that we're independent... England's like, well, we don't have to protect you anymore. You're on your own. And that leaves American ships open to piracy, uh, open to attack by you, other uh, uh, taking confiscation by other uh, militaries and other navies. Uh, we're going to talk about, when we deal with the War of 1812, uh, the uh, problem of impressment, where they go and basically kidnap American sailors and force them to serve as soldiers in their army. And all this is being done because the U.S., can't really do much to stop them. Uh, we don't have much of a navy. We can't form a navy because of the Articles of Confederation. Um, and on top of this, the British start clamping down any ports that we could go to to trade and blocking us from going in and putting pressure on any other nation around the world not to trade with us. The British see us as competition. They don't want us to succeed. So they try to put as many barriers as they can. Um, on top of this, they tell, as a policy, the British are no longer allowed to buy goods from America. So one of the main marketplaces where we sold our goods is closed. And then to make, um, to make it uh, take away the incentive for Americans to buy goods that were made in America, the British start flooding our markets with goods that are cheaper than American goods. Uh, so Americans who are already dealing with an economic depression have the choice, do I buy American, which is more expensive, or do I buy goods from the British, which are cheaper? So then we see that more American businesses go out of business because more people are buying, buying British goods because they're cheap. So now the economies hurt even worse. Ay, ay, ay. So to help the American economy grow, people should be buying American, but... Most people aren't because the British are putting so many cheap goods in and making it hard for Americans to sell their goods. And what can the American government do about it? Nothing, thanks to the Articles of Confederation. Um, when the U.S. government sends John Adams as a delegate to try to, as an ambassador to try to negotiate a trade deal with the British, he basically can't do anything with it because he can't force the other states to comply. So the British are like, why are we going to make a deal with you, represent the U.S. government, when you don't have control of most of your states? We make a deal with you, and Virginia is still no longer complying with what we want. Your, your deal is worthless. So no country wants to deal with our foreign with us on foreign policy, make any trade deals, any uh, sort of... Treaties, nothing, especially the British. And 
the Articles of Confederation, again, leaves any everybody powerless to deal with this situation. And you take that the situation in the West is unstable. You take that U.S. merchants can no longer sell their stuff around the world and no longer safe to sell. And that the British are flooding U.S. markets with cheap goods and American merchants can't sell their goods here. This leads to a worsening of the economic problems and the economic depression gets even worse. To paraphrase Biggie Smalls, no money, no problems. So... What I'd like you to do is uh, give me uh, an explanation of how the Articles of Confederation left the U.S. government powerless to deal with foreign crises and cite one example from the things that we've talked about or from your own research. Yeah. Um, you can post that uh, as a comment underneath uh, this or, um, even better, put it in uh, your assignment that you turn in to the classwork for day five. Well, thanks for watching. Have a fabulous Friday, my friends. Um, congrats again on doing a uh, strong first week. It's going to get better and easier from here. I'm proud of all of you. Have a good one.